My name's Juanita Todd, and I'm one of the many scientists from the University of Newcastle. And it's my pleasure to be here for you, to be your MC for this afternoon's Time Warped National Science Week celebration. Unfortunately, due to the lockdown, which I'm sure some of you might remember, um, we were not able to run this event in August when we hit lockdown. And we wanted to wait until the university doors were open again so we could host this in person. And it's absolutely fabulous to see so many of you here today. And I would like to give a shout out to all of those of you that are joining us online today as well. Welcome to this afternoon's event. Okay, so we all know why we're here and we know why we have a crowd and it's not uh, because I'm emceeing, it's because of Dr. Carl, the one and only. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Dr. Carl. Before we get underway today, I would like to, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you, Lauren Collier from the University's Office of Indigenous Strategy and Leadership to provide an acknowledgement of country. Lauren is a valued representative of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island community and someone from whom we can continue to draw knowledge and advice. Our First Nations people were the first scientists of this land and they had a deep understanding of the world around them and they've passed that understanding down through 65,000 years. So I'd like to welcome you now, Lauren, to the stage. Well, good afternoon, everybody, on this wild and windy day. Um, thank you for braving the weather and coming to join us here. Um, my name's Lauren Collier, and I'm a proud Banjan woman, um, and it's my great privilege to acknowledge country here today. So I see lots of young people out there. Um, does anyone know whose country we're on today? Young people? Awabakal, beautiful. Thank you. We are on the lands of the Awabakal people. Uh, here in Mullabimba, which is the um, name of Newcastle for 60,000 years before. Um, and Mullabimba means place of sea ferns, so that's where we are today. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the Awabakal people, um, their elders past and present, and also any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are joining us here today. Um, I'll also give a shout out to the Waramai mob. So just across the Hunter River is Waramai country. Um, so this was a bit of a meeting place here between those two groups. Um, look, at the university we always acknowledge country when we come together and meet. And it's particularly important today as we're here talking about science. And what is science? You know, it is understanding the world around us and how it works from the smallest atoms to the biggest stars in the sky. And as Juanita said, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were the first scientists. So we were the first botanists, the first geologists, the first astronomers. Our understanding of the natural world is almost unsurpassed by other cultures. And so it is fantastic today to be able to stand here as an Aboriginal person and talk about that great history um, and knowledge of our natural world. Um, and so I wonder if anyone out there, does anyone know of, of an Aboriginal scientist? Does any, any of the school kids know? Anyone know, can name an Aboriginal scientist? No? Anyone got a $50 note? I wish. <laughs> I'm happy to see one if you've got one. I rarely see them. Next time you've got a $50 note in your hands, have a look. There is a man on there, and his name was David Unipon. And he was a great Aboriginal scientist. Um, and what David did, and this was prior to World War I, um, he actually took some of the knowledge of physics that are based around the use of the boomerang and used that to do up some of the first designs for the rotary wing helicopters. And this was prior to World War I. Um, so uh, David had a lot of pat patents and he um, was a great inventor, but as an Aboriginal man he was often, you know, he struggled to have some of those registered. He was, um, he lived in the times of the 1920s. Um, and so, you know, we have this, we have $50 notes, you have this person um, probably in your pocket half the time and not knowing who it is. Um, but there's one great example of a great Aboriginal scientist. Um, so look, I thank you again today for coming. I um, acknowledge the Wobcall people. Um, and thank you, Dr. Carl, for coming and joining us today here on A Wobble Cool Country. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Lauren. Okay, a couple of housekeeping things before we uh, get into this afternoon's activities. If any of you need the bathroom before we finish today, the door is just out here to my right. You need to turn left and there's another set of doors and then you'll find the bathrooms. Um, if we have to leave the building suddenly for any reason, there'll be some lights and you need to follow the exit lights and our staff um, exit routes and we'll exit this building and across the, uh, the road to Civic Park. If you have your mobiles with you, your mobile phones, and I hope you do, um, I'd love you to switch them to silent, but keep them close by because we'll be using those a bit later on for our question and answer session. So we're here today to have some fun with science, learn more about becoming a scientist, and all the amazing jobs that we get to do. You'll find out more about how you can be a scientist even in your own backyard, Plus, you're going to have a chance to ask Dr. Carl all of your curly science questions. And I know that some of you have been thinking about them already, so keep thinking because that time will come. And as human beings, I think we're naturally curious and we wonder about all sorts of things. We wonder about what's up there in space, we wonder about what's going on beneath us in the earth, and we wonder about what's happening in our own bodies and how it works. And to me, being a scientist is about how you put that sense of wonder to work and you answer those questions that pop up into your minds. So I'd now like to introduce Dr. Alex Callan, a researcher here at the University of Newcastle, who's going to tell you all about her journey to becoming a scientist and all the things she gets to explore and discover as part of her job. And we're gonna find out what Dr. Callan wonders about. Okay. Go. You can hear me? Excellent. The next piece of technology I'll fail to use is this one, so let's try this. Amazing. So my name is Alex Callan. I'm a conservation scientist at the University of Newcastle. Um, I spend most of my time in the bush, a little bit of time in the lab, and as little as possible time at the computer, although that is inevitable. I just want to, we thought, we really thought it might be a good opportunity to show you a little bit of what we do. Um, we're not in the bush, so we're going to simulate this a little bit. I think there are three people in the audience who may already have agreed to come on stage and um, demonstrate a night in the life of a conservation scientist. If you're there and you could come down to side stage so that we can get you ready, that would be fantastic. Thank you. We've got one, we've got two. Have we got it third? Thank you very much. I haven't always been a conservation scientist, but mostly I study frogs. I study a lot of other things as well, but I'm particularly interested in frogs. There was a time in my life where I nearly had it all together. My children were out of nappies. I was nearly getting eight hours sleep a night, and I had a good job. But I wasn't asking any more questions and I wasn't learning too much. So I decided to come back to the University of Newcastle and start studying frogs. And apart from these guys getting dressed over here and what you see them do is a lot of what I do every night of the week. You might just need to... You're right over there. What does it mean to be a frog conservation scientist? Pretty much it means you live under a rock and you only come out at night and you'll see why later. Now they look clumsy, but we look just as bad at night when we're trying to do this. So frogs are fascinating creatures. Let's see if this works, this should work. No? This was working. This bit of technology is not my failing. Maybe it is. So frogs belong to a bigger group of animals called amphibians. And the phrase amphi at the beginning of that word amphibian just means both. It refers to the fact that frogs spend part of their time in the water as eggs and tadpoles, 
and they spend the later part of their life on land as frogs. And that's really important because frogs are crucial to the way nature operates. You can see all different kinds of frogs up here. These are all Australian frogs. We have many, many frogs in Australia, about 240 of the ones that we've found and described. And there are about 7,000 in the world overall. But frogs are pretty incredible. They're incredible because of this one main fact that frogs are nearly, well, they're not nearly, I think we know now that they're as old as the dinosaurs. So that means they have survived several global mass extinctions. And they could only have done this by being able to adapt to environmental extremes. In Australia, we have frogs that live in the desert. They burrow down into the sand and they'll only come out on the couple of nights that it rains. In the tropics, we have frogs that have legs so strong that they look like they're flying from tree to tree. All frogs share some similar adaptations, and one of the most amazing ones is that they don't drink water. They will take the water and oxygen through their skin. The other thing that they will do occasionally, and it's pretty gross, is shed their skin, and they'll eat it. And if you've ever seen a frog eat, it has to depress its eyeballs into its skin into its skull to get the food into its gut. So that's why it literally does this, okay? Because that's the only way to get its food into its stomach. Looks like we've got some intrepid frog volunteers up here, so we're going to simulate a night in the life of a conservation scientist very soon. If you've ever had the chance to be out in nature at night, you see the world come alive in a very different way. When you all go to bed and I go to work, I see the most amazing critters. And some of those are cryptic, which is just a crazy word for saying they're mysterious, they're really hard to find. And frogs are a very cryptic animal. Frogs don't like coming out during the day because they get eaten by predators. They like to come out at night when it's safer. And it's one of the reasons that frogs are important is because they're in the middle of the food chain. They are both the predator and the prey. They will be eaten by snakes and by birds, but they will also eat the insects. And some of those insects carry diseases. So if we knock our frogs out of the food chain, we have animals above who have to find something else to eat, and we have insects below that will come to very large numbers. So coming into the field at night is a very fascinating place. And frogs are super cryptic, because even at night, they're really hard to find and we have to do it as a team. And sometimes if they're not facing us, we don't see their eyes. And so we have to use the love songs that frogs use to find them. In Australia, it's the boy frogs who broadcast their love songs out across the marshes or the wetlands or the streams. And we use those songs and a little bit of eye shine and a lot of good luck to try and find our frogs. I might just get our frog volunteers just to come forwards for a moment and we'll check out their stunning attire. I have to say, these are adult waders and they're looking very good in them. Just come over this way. You've done very well. I thought they were going to be much bigger on you. And you can walk. That's great. So these are waders, just like you wear if you're trout fishing. We wear them because we spend nearly all our time at night in water. Out on Kuragang Island at the moment, which is over near Hexham or on the way to the, the airport, um, we have water up to our waders, it's up to the top of our waders. That's how much rain we've had in the last couple of weeks. So you guys would truly be underwater if you're out frogging with us now. We also have head torches. We use head torches so we can have our hands free to catch the frogs. So it's a much easier way of operating than walking around with a hand torch. Now, I'm going to give these guys some instructions, and we're going to see if we can find where some of our frogs are calling, because we know that's how it's easiest to find our frogs. I'm going to play some frog calls, and we're going to turn your torches on, and we're going to see if you can see... What, I want you just to move your body in the direction that you hear the frog sound. Does that sound easy? Yep. OK. I'm going to put you in some different places, all right? Can I get you to stand just over here for me, please? Thank you. I said before that frogging is a bit of a team effort. If you come up here, please. Thank you. And I'll get you to come right down here. 
It's a team effort because we triangulate. So some of these frogs, I said they're cryptic. Not only are they cryptic, but they can call and be hiding in the thickest vegetation. And so sometimes it takes up to three of us to be able to find where these frogs are calling. And we do that by triangulating, which is putting our head torches in the exact place that we think the frog is calling, and we get closer and closer and closer until we can find the frog. So we're going to dim the lights and we're going to get our participants to turn their head torch on. Can you just touch that green button at the top? Yep. Press down, good work. Oh, and you might want to, yeah. Look, look at that, they're not frogs, are they? You might want to just put your head down for a second. Just <laughs> Can you do that? You want me to do that? They're not seasoned froggers. How'd you go? Well done. Okay, now we're going to dim the lights and I'm going to try and play a frog sound and I'm sure that it's one that you are hearing at the moment. So let's see. Where is that sound coming from? Where is it? Up there? There, I think you're right. It's coming from over here. All right, don't fall off the stage. Don't get too excited. Stop. Stop. <laughs> right. So that was well done. The frog was calling from over here. Come on back and we'll just have a quick chat about this frog. Gee, that is a strong light. So this is the common eastern brown froglet. Maybe put your heads down or maybe we turn our torches off again. It's a trap for young players. I didn't think about this. Thank you. Well done. That is the common eastern brown froglet. Did anyone, has anyone heard that song at all? Yeah. This guy calls all year, as long as there's a bit of rain. Um, and he has a very loud call, but he's only about half the size of my thumb. He's also a ground frog, so he's really, really well camouflaged. You can be standing right beside one of these frogs and not see them. Now, this is a common frog. But some of our frogs are in trouble because we never paid any attention to our common frogs. So if you don't hear this sound anymore, feel free to let one of us know because it means that maybe this frog is in trouble. Let's try another one. Are you guys ready to see if you can just point your torch in the direction of this call? Yep, torch is on. And maybe just keep them down until the call goes. Oh, nice. That's it. All right, we can stop there now. Very good. Thank you. These guys have nailed it. So this call, and I should say that these calls were all recorded this week on Kuragang Island, so that beautiful rain that we've had has brought all of the frogs out. So these are not cleaned up calls. They're pretty messy calls with lots of other frogs calling as well. That call was for um, Latoria phallax, the eastern dwarf tree frog. Has anyone heard that call before? Yeah, if you've got this guy calling in your front yard or your backyard, all you have to do is turn on your hose and it'll start singing its love song. That's how much it likes water. Let's put the torches just down a little bit. Thank you. Um, he's also a very common species. He's a tree frog. He's much easier to find at night because he will crawl up on the vegetation and sit on top of the vegetation making his love song. So those are both very common species in the hunter. We have... Um, we're very lucky to have a couple of threatened species as well. So the last one we'll play is for the threatened green and golden bell frog. And we'll give these froggers one last chance before I put them on the books to come frogging out with me. See if we can work out where this one is calling from. Well done. So this is a harder frog. You can barely hear it. It's growling. It's going... Can you hear that? You cannot hear that. I could barely hear that. That is a frog that, thank you very much, do you want to turn those head torches off? That is a frog that has a cousin in Victoria calling, called the growling grass frog. He has a cousin in Western Australia called the motorbike frog. And I think listening to him, I can understand why um, they may be called that. But here, this particular frog is called the green and golden bell frog. Hands up if you've heard about the green and golden bell frog. Oh, I'm so relieved. 
I spent half of my life working on the green and golden bell frog. I'm glad you've heard of it. We're very lucky to have it in the Hunter. We've got one of the last healthy populations. But for anyone who's old enough, this is the frog that paused the Sydney Olympic Park development. So this frog is in a lot of trouble. Um, but in the Hunter, we seem to be doing all the right things to keep, keep the population stable. A big round of applause for our frog scientists. Thank you very much. Do you, want to, do you want to come over and get off your waders? Now, those guys might be sweating in their waders, so if you see any wet marks when they take them off, it's just the sweat from the waders. The last thing I want to leave you with is just a message about how important our frogs are and how everything you saw today is something that anyone can do in their backyard or their local park or their stream. We've just talked about how we detect frogs using their, hearing their love songs. Anyone can do this. And there are two programs that allow you to do this quite easily, one run by the Australian Museum and one run by us at the University of Newcastle. The, the one with a picture of the frog on it is a program called Frog Find. We have 200,000 calls, recorded calls of frogs across all of New South Wales. We've put those online because we were running citizen science projects through the pandemic and people were very upset that they couldn't get out with us to listen to the frogs. So we put all of these recordings online and now people can get on and do some online training and actually help us identify which frogs are calling in those recordings. The other one run by the Australian Museum is called Frog ID. Has anyone got the Frog ID app on their phone? A couple of people, that's fantastic. This is a very funky phone app. It lets you go wherever you are, turn on the app, record the love song of the frog, and it gets sent off to the Australian Museum. They know exactly where you were when it was recorded, and they will send you back the name of the frogs that were singing their love song into your phone. Both of these programs help us keep an eye on where our frogs are at, how vulnerable they are, what stresses they might be facing, so that we have a very good handle on how to help them survive into the future. And that's really the life of a conservation scientist. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alex, that's fantastic. Dr. Callan, I think I'll be coming, becoming a friend of frogs very soon. I'll be looking for that app. Thank you, Alex. And no doubt we'll have plenty more uh, singing songs, uh, singing songs, singing soggy frogs out there in the rain um, this weekend. And I'm sure you're going to have some new little budding junior scientists wanting to get out there to help you. So next, it's my pleasure to welcome the um, uh, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Newcastle, Professor Alex Zielinski, to introduce today's very special guest. Thank you, Anita. That was, uh, I should say, Professor Todd <laughs> and, uh, and Dr. Alex Callan. That was a tr tremendous uh, presentation, Alex, and I've learned a little bit more about frogs, and uh, I'll be looking out for them. And it's a great, uh, great idea, that Frog ID app. I think uh, we should all try it out. But let's, um, we've got a special guest here to introduce uh, this afternoon, and it's uh, Wonderful to have Dr. Carl back here in the Hunter and in Newcastle. He's been a great friend uh, to the university and has continually sought to help the university, but also our community and get uh, science out to, into the schools. Uh, many of you know him uh, very well, and I'm, I'm proud to say he's my friend, and I've known him for quite some years. As it turns out, we're both from Wollongong, and. Uh, lived in the same street. I used to, I'm a bit younger than him, doesn't look good like it, but I am. And he used to drive past my house in an MG open with long curly hair. If you, that was back in the day. But uh, since then he went on to study uh, at the university. He's uh, studied physics, mathematics, biomedical engineering and medicine. And uh, really is, and then went on to have a fantastic career as a science communicator. He's in print, radio and television, and social media. You can hear him on the radio quite often. He's published 47 books at the last time I checked. 
and uh, he really is becoming internationally recognised for his work, his research, particularly his enthusiasm for taking the world of um, um, science to, the, to, 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 all, to all of us. So thank you very much. And so it's my great pleasure to invite Dr. Karl Trzynicki to join us in a time-warped National Science Week celebration. So please welcome Dr. Karl. So in time of social media, I'm going to get a photo of me and Dr. Carl together. Oh. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, flippy, flippy. Flippy, flippy. Oh. Flippy. flippy. Yeah. And we get the audience behind us as yeah. well. Okay. Oh. So you've got to be, get your best smile on underneath your mask. Okay, here we go. Holding it up. We can see you there in the background. Yep, yep, yep. And one more for safety. You know what they say. Uh, here we go, hitting the other button, and the other button, uh, and then that button, and here we go, here we go and again. again. Ah, All right. thank, you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Alex. Thank you. Look, it's lovely coming back to Newcastle for about the, I think, the 50th or 60th time. Um, I love this place. Uh, Wollongong and Newcastle were kind of related you know, via a whole bunch of things, and um, who knows how the relationship will go in the future. That's um, me up there, uh, and we do, are doing a bit of a time warp, so very happy to talk about time warps and so forth. Um, and that was Professor Alex, and here I am again. And what do all of these places have in common? Now, Alex has said we're going to give away a BMW, a block of flats in Tasmania. Uh, anybody got an, a, a guess what they all have in common? You're, oh, you're so close. What they have in common was that each of them was, in the past, one of the largest cities in the whole world, the head of a giant empire that came and went. And as Dr. Alex pointed out, if you want some, something really permanent, don't go for human civilization, go for a frog or a dinosaur. Okay, so one thing about all of these cities is that they're in the northern hemisphere. None of them are in the southern hemisphere. I've never heard of Mohenjo-Daho, but that was in Pakistan. Um, and in Australia, back in the 1920s, our colonial masters thought that Australia wasn't good for much, but luckily we did have wheat. And the wheat appeared around these sort of areas there where you've got that sort of cross-hatching type of thing going on, not the green. And it turns out that we also had something else in Australia in the 1920s called sheep. And that was that green area over there. That's where the sheep were. And all of this other stuff, well, that was just no sheep. Good for nothing. Nobody lived there. Nothing happened. There was no idea. It was just completely empty. What did they know back then? Okay, here's your third chance <coughs> to... Um, win the BMW, the luxury German car, and the black flats. What uh, do all of these states have in common? No, they're all purple, close. No, these are the only cities or the only countries in the world that see education as a worthwhile investment in the future. And as Professor Alex m mentioned, uh, I've had lots of education. I've had 28 years of education I know, that's longer than a sentence for murder. 16 years of u at university, and all of it for free, because back then, Australia saw education as a worthwhile investment in the future. And so, you all deserve free education, because you matter. You matter, until, of course, you multiply yourself by the speed of light squared, in which case, you energy. Your energy, you know, okay, okay here we are, right, okay. Uh, e equals mc squared. So that's the energy, that's the mass. They're both the same thing. Energy is just mass that's being liberated to run free. And um, mass, matter, is just energy that's being coalesced. And one of the big people who talked about that was Albert Einstein. And he came up with a concept over a century ago of gravitational waves. When you would accelerate anything, anything with mass, it would give off gravitational waves. Mind you, the gravitational waves off my hand, speeding up and slowing down, are really quite slow. So you need a big, fat mass. And one and a half billion light years away 
one and a, quarter, one and a half billion light years ago, uh, what we ha had happened was the two black holes with masses up around 30 times the mass of the sun smashed into each other and created something that had slightly less mass. It was missing by about three times, so that adds up to about 65. And what happened to that three times the mass of the sun? Well, in one tenth of a second, it got turned into pure energy. And for that one tenth of a second, that event of the two black holes smashing into each other gave out roughly 50 times as much power as every star in every galaxy in the entire universe put together. Wow. All just for a tenth of a second. Since then, we've discovered a whole bunch of these events going on. And what happens is when the star, you know, smashes into another star and they collapse, black hole, neutron star, whatever, is that they send out ripples through the fabric of space and time. So space expands and contracts this way and that way and backwards and forwards, and also time speeds up and slows down. So this sort of ripple passes through your body. How do we pick it up? Well, it took us a century to work out how to do it. And what you do is you get a big fat laser and then you aim it up at this little mirror. And part of the laser beam goes there and part goes there, bounces off the mirrors, comes back, and then you, you set it up so the hills, you know how waves are hills and valleys? You set it up so the hills of one coincide with the valleys of the other. So when nothing is happening and there's no gravitational waves happening, you get absolutely nothing. You just get nothing. You're just sitting there all day. You switch the machine on. It's taking you a century to build it. A whole lot of scientists, you get nothing. And then suddenly, a gravitational wave of event happens. You know, this energy is released. And then suddenly, one of the arms gets a little bit longer or shorter. And the waves that come here and here, they're not on top of each other. They're just a little bit out of sync. And then suddenly, you're picking up gravitational waves. And so how much do they influence the Earth by? Well, the Earth is about 13,000 kilometers across. And when one of these waves comes through, it changes the diameter of the Earth by two and a half times a thousandth of a millionth of a millionth of a meter. But on that four kilometer length arm, it's a lot less. Not, you know, it's just the whole 12,000 kilometers. It's just four kilometers. It's roughly two and a half times the diameter of a proton. Um, and on that four and a half kilometer length at, at LIGO, they can pick up a change in length of one ten thousandth of the diameter of a proton. Now just imagine that. You've got a four kilometer long string, and you can measure a change in length of that string, not to one atom, not to the nucleus, not to the proton, but to a ten thousandth of a proton. That's how good we humans are. So these gravitational waves, now that we can detect them, the obvious next thing is besides detecting them, we will try and generate them and come up with this wonderful thing that we all need, which is a hoverboard in Back to the Future 3. That's the whole point of this research. But there was a strange event that happened when all of this happened way back in the past. What happened was that on that day, here we go, um, so this is a paper. Ah, yes, yeah, what happened? On that day, on the 15th of September in the year 2015, the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, got booted out. And then three hours later, this gravitational wave came rippling through the Earth. And the obvious, the only obvious question is, who wrote the paper? And the answer is, several thousand people from several thousand uh, universities and the like. And here's the abstract of the paper that they wrote. And the three main authors are Abbott, Abbott, and Abbott. <laughs> On the day that Tony Abbott got booted out, the gravitational waves came and they wrote a paper. Coincidence? I don't think so. There's something going on. Like, there's 24 hours in a day and 24 cans in a slab of beer, it's not a coincidence. There's something going on. In this particular case, I don't know what uh, ex-Prime Minister Abbott's relationship to all of this. Maybe he turned into a scientist. And one thing we do know is that when it comes to science and mathematics and arts and everything else that makes human, humanity worthwhile, we definitely need the favorite thing that the universe has given us, the world's most common popular drug, the stuff in here, coffee. The drug is called caffeine. So here's caffeine. Now, I'll just take you through a little bit of chemistry. It's not too hard. You can forget it straight away. 
Over here is what we call a methyl group, CH3, an atom of carbon married to three atoms of hydrogen, and there's a couple of them over here, one there and one there. This thing in the middle, you call it a xanthine. You don't have to remember this. It's called a xanthine. You can forget it in a minute. And so what happens is because uh, you've got a, a methyl group at the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven position, you call it one, three, seven. And because there's three of the methyls, one, two, three, you call it trimethyl, and it's called a xanthine. And the thing about this is that it is a vasoconstrictor. It closes up the blood vessels. On the other hand, there is another food called chocolate. And Linnaeus, who was the god of botany, he loved chocolate so much, he gave it the name of theobromine. Theo, as in theology, bromine to drink, the drink of the gods. And it's similar. It's got two of these guys. It's got a xanthine. It's got two of the methyls, none over there. So it's 3,7-dimethylxanthine, and it is a vasodilator. It opens up blood vessels. And so now suddenly it all begins to make sense. You've got one drug or one substance that increases your blood pressure slightly and another substance that decreases your blood pressure slightly. And this then finally answers the big problem that the philosophers have been worrying about for thousands of years, which is, does God exist? And the answer is, yes, God does exist. And if she does exist, she won't wants you to have chocolate every single time you have coffee. It's, it's there, written down in the fabric of the universe. You've just got to look harder and you'll actually see what's going on. So we have this here with coffee, and people ask themselves, should I have coffee? Should I give it up? OK, just a little show of hands in the audience. Have, put your hand up if you yourself have said, or you've heard somebody else say, Oh, gee, you know, I think, I'll get I think I'll get healthy. I'll give up caffeine. Have you ever heard anybody say that? Or Right, completely wrong, wrong. No, no, no. You, it improves your life expectancy and the outcome if you have liver disease or type 2 diabetes or if you have prostate cancer or heart disease or skin and oral cancers. But, but, these findings blah, 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 are based on what we call observational studies. Now, an observational study is something like the American Nurses Study. That's a really famous study. You look at a third of a million nurses in America for a third of a century, and gradually things bubble up to the surface. If you eat good food, you live longer, and if you eat bad food, you don't. If in some parts of America you have black skin and live in a city, you will die sooner than if you have white skin and live in a city. Or if you smoke cigarettes, you die sooner. So all these things sort of bubble up to the surface, but we don't know what causes what. You know, like correlation is, there's a correlation, is not causation. You know, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. Like there is a terrific correlation between the, cons the daily consumption of margarine across the entire United States and up in the top right-hand corner, in the state of Maine, the daily divorce rate. Does somebody eating margarine in Florida make somebody else divorce somebody? No, no, no. So correlation is not causation. So to get that sort of stuff out, you need the proper stuff, the randomized double-blind study. Good studies like this one here from American, from the Nature magazine called A Chronic Low Dose of Delta-9 Tetrahydrocannabinol Restores Cognitive Function in Old Mice, which is fairly complicated, so I'll turn it into plain English, which is that a little cannabis every day might, notice a might, keep brain aging at bay. It may boost rather than dull the elderly brain, or in plain English, to go right down to it. It improves the memory in old mice. And in the study, what they did was get themselves a whole bunch of mice of different ages. Young, two months, old, and um, mature, 12 months and 18 months. And then they put a little pump in their tummy, buried inside, just running away. And the pump would either deliver salt water or salt water with a little bit of cannabis. And they did this for a really long time in a mouse's life, like a whole month. And with the older mice, they found that their memory started coming back and their performance was really good and they were really good at doing mazes and intellectually they were a lot better on average. The younger mice were just off their faces. Forget 
and we'll explain why in just a little while. So what's going on here? How can we have this situation that if I've got terrible pain, like from smashing up my shoulder, I can take some opiates and it will make the pain go away? And the answer is, it's a coincidence, because after all, that plant is made of plant, but I'm made of meat. How come one works on the other? And it turns out that I, in my body, I make my own natural opiates. Opium. Opium comes from a little purple poppy in Turkey, and my body makes morphine. And so in the early days when we discovered it, we called it endogenous. Endo means from within. Genus means to grow. Endogenous morphine. And we turned it into endorphin. We got rid of the genus and the morph. So endogenous morphine, just got called into morphine, and so that's why opiates work, because we make our own opiates, and the external drugs we put in a much bigger dose than our body makes, and bingo, the pain of smashing your shoulder into 40 pieces with a surfboard just goes away. And that's why they work. And it turns out that cannabis does the same thing. Cannabinoids. Now, just a show of hands, who has heard that when you're doing exercise and you go for a run, it's the endorphins that make you feel good? I'm sorry, we're all wrong. La believe it or not, just last week it came through. Yes, exercise makes you feel gooder. It's not the endorphins. It's the cannabinoids. The reason that cannab cannabis works on humans is that we make our own natural endogenous internal cannab cannabinoids, and they're everywhere. Like They're in the immune response and the maturation of the central nervous system and phosphorylation. Look up phosphorylation if you're bored on a Saturday night in Wikipedia, and neurogenesis and programmed cell death and iron, everywhere you look in the whole body. And this we've only discovered over the last 10 to 15 years, and at the moment that we've gone from it's evil and it will kill you, any, any touch of cannabis, into it'll cure everything and improve your handwriting and get rid of sunstroke, syphilis, and varicose veins, and eventually we'll get back to it will have some uses for some people in various narrow, well-defined areas. So with the cannabis, we've found that when the mice get older, they lose the number of nerve endings where one nerve talks to another, Cannabis brings the numbers back up again. And the old mice revert to the men mental function of the younger mice. And it turns out that another part of your body besides the nerves is the DNA. And what DNA does is it tells the genes to make proteins. And as you get older, you just don't make as many, unless you take the cannabis, in which case it comes back again. Now, when you're born, you've got virtually no endocannabinoid system. Until you hit puberty, then it just goes sky high. And it stays sky high until you're in your mid-20s, and then it just sort of fades away, and then fades with time. And they're trying to see if it works with humans, and so there are actually studies going on right now to see if this is true, whether the low-dose cannabis will work on humans. And there's a few disclaimers here. A lot. So the first one is that the, the good effects are really variable. So some mice would go, hmm, you want me to walk on that maze, but I can see there's a fractal pattern which makes it really easy if you just use a double differential of a third power. <laughs> Whereas other mice are going, where am I? What day is it? Okay. So for some mice it worked really well, and some mice it did nothing. Secondly, mice are not humans, and as an example, we do have a similarity with mice. Do we both can potentially suffer from Alzheimer's disease. For mice, we have discovered 1,000 drugs that work really good on fixing up mice with Alzheimer's disease. Of those 1,000 drugs, 997 don't work or have really bad side effects, and three might work, but you kind of sort of juggle the side effects, and gee, we don't know if they work or not. So mice are not humans. And Paracelsus said, half a thousand years ago, all drugs are poisons, what matters is the dose. So if you're worried about fluoridated water, sure, the fluoride can kill you if you take a million times overdose of water, but water will kill you if you take a three times overdose. 
If you have nine liters of water a day, you're heading on the way out, and your brain will start to swell. So what matters is the dose. And then finally, the human brain matures in the 20s, you know, like, and unfortunately, you've got the human endocannabinoid system sort of taking off at pu puberty and going high and then just basically failing down into the shriveled thing that I am today, like, like a badly packed sack of potatoes. But God, the, my George Clooney days are gone. So the human brain matures in the 20s, and if people who are in their puberty to 20s take a fair amount of cannabis, they can end up derailing themselves. But then every society has drugs. I'm just not buying into it one bit at all. Because what can happen is that you can you know, find people sort of losing their memory. And it happens to all of us, where you walk out the front door and you think, where do I park the car or the bike? Or you're working away and you come down to the kitchen to get a drink and you think, why am I in the kitchen? Oh, yeah, I was going to make a cup of tea. And you make the cup of tea and then you go back to where you were going and you think, oh, what was I doing before I got here? Is the problem that you are suffering from dangerously low blood levels of cannabis? No, almost certainly it's not that or early onset dementia. The problem is the evil doorway. Yes, the doorway is the problem. And it's based on a few different things. The first thing is that the universe is out to get you. Nothing personal. You might think that you are the peak of human evolution because we have invented poetry, income tax, and weapons of mass destruction. But as far as a bacteria are concerned, or a kangaroo, Okay, they're, they're herbivores. Or a lion, you're just meat, right? So the universe is dangerous, and it's out to get you, and so you're always looking out for threats. But the other thing is that the universe is big, so you're always looking out for threats everywhere. And there's so many threats coming in all the time that what you have to do is simplify them down. You've got various programs or algorithms running in your brain automatically in the background to take care of you. And so that's part of why we have these things to simplify it and we can get through the day without worrying too, about things too much. The, I found out about this whole thing about doorways being so dangerous from this wonderful press release. Now, here's some good advice for you, Professor Alex. Uh, the, it's called Walking Through Doorways Causes Forgetting, and you think, wow, what a catchy title. I've got to get those people working on my publicity team to give good publicity here to the University of Newcastle. I have no idea where they came up with such a catchy title, except maybe they plagiarized it from the actual paper, Walking Through Doorways Causes Forgetting. And don't forget the number one rule about plagiarism. Plagiarize, plagiarize, let nobody else's work evade your eyes. I didn't say that. So you're working through doorways. It causes forgetting. And here was the experiment that they did. They actually got a physical house. And they put some tables in it. So here's a house. So that's a doorway. And that's a doorway. And that's a doorway. And that's a wall. And where you see those X's, that's where they have tables. And on the tables are some objects. And you're wearing a backpack. So you come up to it and you put an object, some sort of weird object, like a blue wedge or a yellow cube, you know, not, not like something like a cup of tea or something, and you put it in your backpack and then you go walkie, 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 and then you work out whether you remember or you forget. And if you go through a doorway, here's a summary, you forget. So here's the example. So you start off over here and you go walk, 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 ah. I know, I've got a yellow cube. Reach over, get the yellow cube, put it down on a table. You prove that you have not forgotten. Ah, but maybe it's because you went into another room and came back again? Let's try this. So you go into this other room, you do a few extra steps, and you're in another room, and blow me down, you forget. But why did you forget? Was it because of the extra distance, or the room, or the doorway? So then you do what in Wollongong we would call a blocky, uh, you know, where you drive on the street at night trying to look really cool by having the radio on really loud with all the windows down, playing Celine Dion really loudly, wondering why you don't look so cool. Yeah, I know. So do you call it a blocky up here, where you go around the block many times? Is it a mani? Professor Alex hasn't done either a blocky or a manix. Mani. No, anybody? Is it a blocky or a manie? A what? A fat lap. A fat lap. A fat lap. Okay, you do a blocky or a manie or a fat lap, and so you do a fat lap around the door, and you go back to the, ta the that same table in the first room. 
So now, the only thing is that you've done that fat lap, as we call it here in Newey, and you forget. And just to prove that everything's all back to normal, you don't forget. So what's going on? How come the doorway wipes your memory? Well, let's go back about five million years ago, or seven million years ago, when we humans split off from the chimpanzees. We didn't come from the chimpanzees, we didn't come from the apes, but we split off from the chimpanzees. And about two million years ago, we had two mutations happen. We lost our body hair, so the protein that used to go into our hair went into our brain. Our brain began to get bigger. So we had to survive. When you're in the jungle, it's very straightforward. Jungle, 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 swing, swing, swing. Look out for the killer gorilla. I'm only a small thing. Look out for the gorilla. Very clear on what happens. But then when we started walking out, because we had a mutation on our hips, when we started walking out on the open plain, switching between the jungle and the open plain, suddenly you've got to look over to here and there for the flash of khaki in the grass, which could be a lion. Now, if you were walking out onto the open and you're thinking, oh, gorilla, 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 well, mate, the lion would just pick you off. So we're wired up that when you go through a doorway, you forget. Anytime you go through a doorway, you forget and you go into a sort of automatic mode of, I'm into the kitchen, you've got your guns up like they have in John Wick, kill a dishwasher, safe, kill a sink, safe. Kill a fridge, okay, safe to enter a room. Okay, and you run through all of that in your brain without even thinking about it, and you think, okay, I'm here in the kitchen, but why did I come here? Right? So is the cure that we simply just ban open doors and we ban doorways, just have an open plan house with no doorways? Yes, that's a good idea to make people slightly more efficient, but the problem is what about when you're having a party and everybody's been drinking a lot and you might have what's called um, losing or breaking the seal. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with breaking of the seal, I'll explain to you. It happened, I was very surprised when it happened to me in my late 20s. And what happens is you've gone out for a night with the boys or the girls and you're having a few little drinkies, and it's just a really nice night, and you just have a few more drinks than normal, and it's still a very nice night, and then suddenly you get this incredible feeling of bladder awareness, and you really got to get to the bathroom quickly, and you do, and you pass so much water, you have so much of a wee, that you think you're getting a friction burn on the inside of your, of your urethra. It just keeps on coming, like, okay, more, it's still more, oh my God, it's still coming. You know, an hour later, you're still, you know, and that's called breaking the seal, and it does seem that for the rest of the night, you have to keep going back. Is there an actual seal in your body that you're breaking? No. This is the answer, in six words, separated by a comma. Drink a six-pack, urinate a 10-pack. More comes out than comes in. Let me explain. We're talking two things here. We're talking the sheer volume of what you're having, and we're talking the fact that alcohol is, I know, hard to believe, it is actually a drug. So when you think about it, it's kind of weird. You've got this stuff, alcohol, which will strip oil stains off the garage floor and will preserve body parts of an axolotl for a quarter of a thousand years, and yet in small quantities, in a human, will make you more relaxed and less shy. How does it do that? Okay, that's one thing. The other thing is that keeping your body just an automatic system, running at the right saltiness, you've got a system to keep your hydration just right. At one extreme, you might go out and you might drink lots and lots of water and do nothing, and then you pass lots and lots of urine, very light colored. Or you might go out and work all day in the hot sun, forget to bring your bottle of water, pass hardly any wee at all, and it's really dark. And the reason there's that big difference is that the hydration level, the osmolality, we can talk about that later if your body is really important, and that's kept in line by a drug called ADH, and alcohol interferes with that drug. Alcohol interferes with your normal hydration levels, so what happens is that you drink uh, 300 or 200 mils of beer, and what comes out is 320. Now, some of the more mathematically inclined among you have already done very quickly the math and worked out that 200 going up to a six-pack 
means that 320 should go up to a 9.6 pack, but it doesn't scan. You know, like drink a six pack, urinate a 9.6 pack, it doesn't scan as well as drink a 10, you know, urinate a 10 pack. So I had to lie to you through mathematics. So we're sort of stuck with the situation that the alcohol does do that. And the other thing is the sheer volume. When somebody says, hey, come around to our place, we're going to have a few cups of green tea, you might have three. But, you know, bottles of beer, you might have more. So they all work together that big way. So the alcohol is governed by this thing. Drink a six-pack, urinate a ten-pack. Now, I prefer drinks with less volume. I'm a fan of, say, uh, rum and coke. Just, just, just one is nice, you know, it's just nice. And rum and coke, besides tasting nice, one, also has taught us much about alcohol and the world. And it turns out that we are so drenched in alcohol in our society that we'll have alcohol at all times. Do you have a good week? Uh, have a drink. No. You have a bad week? Have a drink. Are you happy? Have a drink. Are you sad? Have a drink. You know, so we're so drenched in alcohol, on one hand, it's a legal drug that everybody has access to, and yet we do not teach our children about this drug. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question after this. Suppose you've got two drinks, the rum and cola, the rum and diet cola. Rum and diet cola, and with exactly the same amount of alcohol, the rum and regular cola, they have exactly the same amount of alcohol. Okay? Show of hands, who knew that having one of each, one, one or the other, that if you drink the diet cola, you'll get drunker? Who knew that having... A few of you, ah, see, don't you think it's a weird situation that you're allowed to drive a car, but you've got to get a license for it? Why don't we teach this to the next generation as each, as each generation comes through? So they've got the same amount of alcohol, the diet drinks get you drunker. Why is this? Because they have different amounts of energy, which I learned from Professor Claire Collins. Where are you, Professor Claire? Give us a wave. Claire, where are you, Professor Claire? Somewhere here. Anyway, look, follow her on the conversation. She is so good on nutrition and dietetics. Absolute rock star. We have her on Triple J all the time. She is just so good, and what she does is turn complicated stuff into simple stuff. You want to know about nutrition, trust her. And the reason that the diet drinks get you drunker is because of different amounts of energy. So it goes like this. Here's the paper, artificially sweetened, that's scientific talk for diet, uh, versus regular, that means like a regular rum and cola, Increase gastric emptying. Now, the food or alcohol goes down your esophagus into your stomach, called the gastrum, for, if you want to talk Latin, and then it goes into the small intestine where it is absorbed. So increase gastric emptying and alcohol absorption. So it's saying the diet drinks force the stuff to come out of your stomach quicker and you absorb more of it. Let's run through it. So suppose you've got three rum and diet colas, you've got that much energy. Three rum and regular colas, loaded with sugar, uh, 15, 9 to 15 spoons in a can, double the amount of calories. So what happens is that your stomach, and this I learned from Professor Claire, your stomach pushes stuff from here into your small intestine, not at a rate of volume, like you know, two mils per minute, but on energy. And I said, Claire, but how come I didn't know this? And she said, Carl, how much dietetics did you study in your medical degree? Eight hours. She said, I've done 20 years. <laughs> right, she knows more than I do. Okay, so it pushes it through at a constant rate. And so you end up with, if it's got more calories from the sugar, the whole thing will go, still go through so many calories per minute, but the alcohol is diluted over twice the volume. It takes longer to get there. And also, some of it actually gets destroyed inside the stomach. And so you end up with this situation. We've got two identical twins. And they've been doing the same things every day of their life, except for this night, this fatal night, when they decide to go to a party and have different drinks. One is going to have three or two rum and regular colas. And the alcohol blood level goes up to there and then begins to fade down below the 0.05 limit. Get picked up by the cops on the way home, get waved on, nothing to see here, move right along. The other twin has the diet colas. Gets pumped up to over the limit. Ends up getting pulled over by the cops. Bit of an unfortunate miscarriage of justice. 
bit of paperwork goes wrong, end up getting in the cells for too long, get very friendly with a very large person who has love and hate tattooed on their knuckles and is a member of the local bikies gang. And then by the time they come out, they are a card-carrying member of the Hells Angels. And that person, because they went to jail and they got twisted, they will end up outside your nieces or nephews' children high school, primary school selling methamphetamine off the back of a big Harley Davidson because you did not teach them that diet drugs get you drunker. It's the fault of society, and we've got to fix this. So, <laughs> so that's sort of the light and fluffy part of our little show tonight. Now let me give you four messages of good hope, and if you want to walk into question time, ask about time warps, let's go into it. So the four messages of good hope are, firstly, that we can stop and reverse rising carbon dioxide levels and climate change. That we are living in one of the most peaceful times ever in the history of the human race. That the young people in the audience are smarter than their parents. And that the last one is that we can fix COVID-19. So let's dive in into the climate change. So the first one is that the fossil fuel companies have been lying to us about climate change since 1990. I've written a book on this called Dr. Carl's Little Book of Climate Change Science, about 10 bucks, a little tiny book. And so the best science in climate science was paid for and done by the fossil fuel companies from the 1970s to the, 19, to the beginning of 1990. And then in 1990, they chucked a U-turn and they said, oh, it's not real, just not real anymore. You think that's hard to believe? Well, I'll convince you a bit later. Second thing, what is happening with global warming? How does it happen? Is it global warming happening because we're burning fossil fuels and the heat of the fossil fuel burning causes the heat of global warming? No, that's microscopic. What happens is the burning causes gases to be emitted like carbon dioxide, which act like a one-way valve. And as you can see on the screen, each day they trap 400,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of heat over what they used to in 1750. You can get away with 400,000 Hiroshima bombs worth of heat for a day or a week or a month or a year or a decade, maybe two decades, but not longer than that. Why? Why do we burn fossil fuels? They are loaded with energy. Think about a tradie trying to shift bricks from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill, plain old physics, how much energy do you have to put in, joules, blah, 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 blah. Compare that to the energy in a bar barrel of oil. A tradie for 10 years, 50,000 a year costs you half a million dollars for a laborer. The same amount of energy that a laborer puts out over 10 years, you can buy in one single barrel of oil for 50 bucks. If you burn two to three barrels of oil every minute, that's a lot, 159 litres, you can get a big aluminium tube with wings and fly it halfway around the world with 600 people. You do that for 20 hours, you've flown 600 people from Australia to England. Massive amount of energy, absolutely huge. That's why we burnt fossil fuels, because they're just loaded with energy. The effects of climate change, besides the fact that we've had the, we burnt one-fifth of all the forests in Australia last year, and that Sydney was the hottest place on planet Earth on the 4th of January. We have also tipped the Earth off its axis, and it seems as though we've made the Earth spin faster. We can talk about that. Can you believe it? Us humans have, made, have tipped the Earth off its axis, and the good news is that we can fix it. So if you go to Draw Down Review, wonderful little document, uh, easy to download. Uh, it gives you the international point of view uh, from drawdown.org. And it deals with, firstly, reducing the sources. We, we can get 90% of our emissions down to zero just by simply not burning fossil fuels anymore. That's it, 90% of the problem we just say, draw a line in the sand. But I do believe that the federal government is currently exploring, and you might enjoy this, uh, of having an offshore oil field all the way up the coast from Manly to past Newcastle. Just in case you, you didn't have enough gas, you know, you need to set up another one, right? Um, so we can bring it to zero, support the sinks. Now we suck the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with natural sources and all the way up to full military industrial. And we can bring the conditions back to what they were in the 20th century. And of course, it'll improve society. In the year 2018, 45 million people around the world died. 
20% of them died from air pollution overwhelmingly caused by burning fossil fuels. One-fifth of everybody who died before COVID was killed by, burning, by the pollution from fossil fuels. Do they give any compensation to the family, pay for the funeral costs? No, they're getting a free ride. So that's drawdown.org. Then this mob here, zero emissions and beyond. Uh, they're an Australian mob, and they can go to, we can, they reckon we can do the same thing, bring the conditions way back down. Drawdown.org is where you go for the international point of view. bze.org.au is where you go beyond zero emissions, is for the Australian point of view. And it's called the Zero Carbon Australia Research, or the Million Jobs Plan. And that's interesting about the jobs. There's all sorts of jobs, a whole lot more jobs. There are many more jobs involved in renewables than there are in fossil fuels. The number of people working in coal and fossil fuels is microscopic compared to this. And the other thing is, that in addition to having many more jobs than you do get in fossil fuels, the jobs are local. You don't have the FIFO, fly in, fly out, where somebody is earning lots of money, they're gone for three weeks, come back for one week, gone for three weeks, come back for one week. And what that means, after about a year and a half, the family is starting to fall apart because somebody's only there one quarter of the time and they're not part of the family. These are all local jobs. How do we do it? We do what the Americans did on the 7th of December, 1941, which is basically that they went ape. Pearl Harbor got bombed. Up until the 7th of December 1941, the Americans had built a total of 3,000 aeroplanes over the previous half century, 3,000. In the next four years, they built not 3,000, 300,000 in four years. 300,000 in four years. Huge aeroplane with a very powerful engine, could fly a long way. And America just built all these factories all over the place. And just one factory, one typical factory alone, that they said to the Ford company, build a factory, here's some land, go and build it. It turned out to be the largest single story building in the whole world, a kilometer long by 300 meters wide. And it was pumping out aeroplanes, not at the rate of one a month, or one a week, but one every hour. Now, these planes were built by people who'd been trained up to build them. These were ex-car workers. A car had 15,000 parts. These had half a million parts. They were high-tech parts, and they had to be put together by skilled labor, and they went from making cars into planes and put out 300,000 planes. The Second World War, from the American point of view, was won as much by the machine shop as by the machine gun. And we can do the battle against climate change with technology, but with the advantage that we already have that technology, we'll invent new stuff as we go along, but we don't have to kill people like happens in wars. We'll just make the world a better place. And you're thinking, but Carl, how come you're claiming that the fossil fuel companies are telling lies and have been telling lies since 1990? Sure, I can believe that about big tobacco. Well, here's a poster, as an example of people telling lies. Here's a poster that appeared in every single hospital, including in practically every ward in the John Hunt... Which direction is John Hunt Hospital from here? That way. Including John Hunt Hospital in that way. Uh, this poster appeared in practically every ward the one on the left. And it has three paragraphs and was shortly replaced by one with two paragraphs. And what it said in that first paragraph was, it is not known if alcohol is safe to drink while you are pregnant. That is a lie, and we have known that to be a lie for about a quarter of a century. And yet in John Hunter Hospital, that poster appeared in virtually every ward. It was a complete lie. The exact opposite is the case. It is known that alcohol is unsafe to drink. And that's what happens when you give too much power to the fossil fuel industry. Now, why did they do that sort of thing? Well, as they say in the movie it's The Godfather... Personal. It's strictly business. Nothing personal. It's strictly business. The fossil fuel companies weren't specifically trying to increase the number of babies that were born mentally retarded and physically deformed. 
That was just collateral damage. But there were these people called pregnant women who weren't drinking alcohol and they wanted to change their minds. Nothing personal, it was strictly business. So we can go to a zero carbon world for electricity in 10 years, if we follow the example of World War II, still in concrete, uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, transport 15 years because we have to develop the hydrogen technology. So Airbus is now in negotiations with Air New Zealand to make a, a fleet of three types of hydrogen powered planes, a little puddle jumper like a Dash 8, a medium range single aisle narrow body like a Airbus 320 or a 737, and then a long range plane like a big triangle. And they reckon they could have them flying in a test mode by 2028 and earning money by 2035. There's your 15 years. And livestock, five to 20 years, there's nothing stopping us, only the political will. Second message of good hope, we, can, we are living in the most peaceful time ever in the history of the human race. So, read the book here. The Better Angels of Our Nature by Steven Pinker, who unfortunately has more hair than I do, and also the book itself has 1,024 pages, so it's a bit of a read. And he covers all sorts of stuff, the big stuff and the small scale stuff. And you look at the big stuff, like wars, people think, oh, the Second World War was the most bloody war in the history of the human race. No, it was not. No, it was not. Let's go back in time to the year 755 AD, when in China there was a revolt by An Lushan. And to put down the revolt in China, the Chinese emperor killed one in every three people in China. One in every six people in the whole world. Genghis Khan, in the 13th century, killed one in every nine people in the whole world. Second World War, one in every 44. Terrible, but still going down in the right direction. And if you look at the small scale stuff, like homicide in Europe, and look at that scale. You think the graph's not going down very fast, but look at that scale. 1,000, 100, 10, and 1. Whoa. So that's falling off. And judicial torture is dropping off, where you torture people to get a confession. And the crimes for uh, murder and slavery, they're all heading down. Why do you wrongly believe? that things are so bad because of the motto of the commercial media, which is, if it bleeds, it leads. If you get a new library or you have a car accident outside the library, which one makes it into the news? The one with all the blood. Okay, two messages of good hope. Now we'll go past the first one and the second one into the third one, which is, you're smarter. Hey, students, you are smarter than your parents and me by about nine IQ points every generation. It's called the Flynn Effect. Here's Professor Flynn. And an IQ test is not perfect, but here's how it works. You give people a bunch of tests, like if green is to steel, then of course magnolia is to sand shoe. I mean, that was too easy, but you know, the sort of thing. You give that sort of test, and then you scale people uh, whether they're right or wrong, and then you adjust it so that the average is 100 over here, you adjust it, and then you squash or expand it so that you've got two-thirds of the population between 85 and 115, and over here at 110, um, that's me. So I'm not particularly smart, but I work hard. I haven't got a lot of horsepower, but what I have, I apply really well. Um, and so I'm in here with two-thirds of the population, so I'm actually just plain old Dr. Carl. But a few years ago, I went to another university in Queensland, and they gave me this gorgeous floppy gown and a lovely velvet hat. Oh, my God, it's nice. And I danced around on stage, and they gave me a bit of paper. And on the paper, it said that I am now a doctor of the university. Now, I've got to tell you the truth. I cannot lie to you. I am a doctor of the university, but it's only an honorary one. It's not a real one. But nevertheless, it does say that I am a doctor of the university, so therefore I'm not just Dr. Carl. I'm actually a bit of music coming up here, get the sound up. I am actually Dr. Dr. Carl, and this is um, Hot Summer Night. Da 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 da. <laughs> Okay, 
doctor, doctor, give me the blues. I've got a bad case of loving you. OK, we'll get right past that. So with the Flynn effect, the effects, uh, the, the IQ tests are calibrated. They're adjusted to give you a score of 100. And most of you have been on this test here, which has been recalibrated upwards several times through the last century because everybody's getting smarter. And so if you did the IQ test of your parents or your grandparents, you'd get either 109 or 118. How do we know this? Because the way that Americans learn geography is by invading another country. And, OK, just kidding. And so we've got really good IQ tests on the American military from 1932 onwards up to now. And the IQ has been going up by nine IQ points every generation, not just in America, but also in many other countries in the world, wherever you bother to measure it. And you can see it going up by 0.3 of an IQ point every year. And there's different tests like the comprehension and the ravens and the information. It doesn't matter. The thing is that the people are getting smarter. We do not know why. We know that it's real. It might be because back in 1900, only 3% of jobs involved thinking, and now it's about 30% of jobs. And people have got more abstract in their thinking. So if I go to a student of today, I would get a very different answer from a primary school student of 1921, where I'd say, excuse me, uh, sir or madam, uh, tell me about a cat and a dog. And back in 1920, they'd say, the dog chases the cat. What else is there to know? But nowadays, it'd be more like, hmm, well, they are both lactating quadrupeds, but they're not reptilian. So are you interested in their branch of the genealogy where they fit, or perhaps their value in society as a help animal to make people more calm and better in their lives? Or perhaps you're looking at the greenhouse emissions. So the world has got a lot more abstract. We don't know why. We know it's real. And to finish off, the last message of good hope is that we can fix COVID-19. Here is the evil virus. It's not evil, it's just a virus. And those, they're the so-called spike proteins. With a bit of luck, we've got a video that might work. Ah, that'll come later. So we, we do know that vaccines do not cause autism. That was started, by the way, by the boyfriend of Elle McPherson. He started that about 20 years ago. He started the myth that vaccines cause autism, and they don't, simply don't. However, if you follow Saturday morning bref, breakfast cartoon, uh, you'll find out that autism spectrum people are overrepresented in research science, which means, OMG, that people with autism can make vaccines and save babies. Um, and this leads us to the concept now of vaccine victory. So this is the last message of good hope. We're going to fix this thing. OK? So the most widely used vaccine on the entire planet is one that's used against the coronavirus. And wait for it, it's been used for half a century. And you're thinking, hang on. COVID-19 started in 2019, 2020. And I'll go, I'll go on. And it saves billions of lives every year. And you're thinking, there's only 7 or 8 billion people on the planet. How can it do that? It is a vaccine that saves the lives of chickens. The story begins way back in 1937. And so there were coronaviruses infecting humans and chickens all over the planet. And one of them mutated. And it would kill the chickens from lung and kidney disease and infect 100% of the flock within 24 hours. And if it came into your flock, you just simply killed them all straight away and burnt them and hope it didn't spread. It took a while, but it took us about half a century to come up with the first commercial vaccine. The situation today is that there's four or 500 different varieties of coronavirus roaming the planet. They have not mutated to become less harmful. They have not. Roaming the planet, trying to kill chickens. And we also have a couple hundred vaccines. And you mix and match them to kill the virus in your area. So what happens is that at, on the day they're born or hatched, every single commercial chicken is vaccinated with a spray. It goes in the air, they breathe it in, goes on their feathers, whoop, whoop, they preen it. And every two weeks after that, if we did not do that, there would be no such thing as commercial chicken dinners, as, as chickens. There would be no such thing as a, a chicken schnitty. Is that New, Newcastle talk? A schnitty, a schnitzel, or a palmy 
chicken parmigiano or baked chicken or fried chicken or even chicken noodle soup. There'd be no such thing. If you want a chicken, you'd say, let's get a chicken. And they'd say, what, 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 what's a chicken? Oh, there's some farmer out there. And you'd drive out, and there'd be a little farm, which could survive because there, was, there weren't many of them around, and the coronavirus hadn't got to it. And you'd buy this thing, and people say, what's this, a, a, a mini turkey? Is it? No, it's a chicken. What's a chicken? Today, we have the situation that the weight of chickens on the planet is greater than the weight of all the other birds, and it's only because they get vaccinated every two weeks of their little lives. So what's going to happen with us is something similar. We will get a vaccine shot against the current, or vaccines against the current strains, which just sounds, you know, just the same as what happens with the flu shot. So, and notice the plural, the, it has to be vaccines and strains. So go to see your local GP, and the GP will say, oh, come on in, Professor Alex, love to see you. Let's have a look at your DNA. Oh, yeah, you've got some strengths and some weaknesses against the coronavirus. Oh, that's good, that's good, yeah, okay. Now, the next thing, where are you going? Uh, you're, a, you're a jet star flyer, aren't you? So you're going to go to Hawaii and maybe go to somewhere else, like Wollongong, so they'll get a vaccine for you. Why? This is why. Now, that, as of this morning, that's the number of documented cases, a quarter of a billion, but almost certainly it's double that because not all the countries in the world have got as good reporting as we have in Australia. And the number of deaths, they're not, it's probably double that too because the thing to look for in the countries that actually do proper documentation is look for the proper documentation. In the countries that do not do the proper documentation, what you look for in the statistics is the number of excess deaths compared to 2019. In some countries in the world, like the USA, it's 50%. Peru, it's 100%. So just look, that's how you find out. And uh, look at this. The vaccine seems to be working. But we, we, that's about one dose for everybody on the planet. But here's the thing. Suppose you go to your local swimming pool, uh, the, you know, the big shared swimming pool, and there's a sign saying, no weeing allowed except in that corner over there. No, because the, the urine would spread through the whole pool. In the same way, the virus will spread across the whole planet. We've got to vaccinate everybody. And in some parts of Africa, the vaccination rate is 3%. And just this morning, just this morning, the World Health Organization talked about a new variety that they've called Omicron. This morning. But don't worry, we'll get through it, okay? And we'll get through it thanks to this guy over here, the vaccines. So it's the pandemic started around there, and then the vaccines started kicking in around here. And you're looking at the weekly vaccine doses of 300, third of a billion. And then look at the cases, one wave, second wave, third wave is less, bring it up for the vaccine. Uh, and that's the cases, looking at the deaths, first wave, second wave, hooray for the vaccine, keeping it down. So the vaccine can help us. And so you'll go to the GP and be tell them you're going to Wollongong and Hawaii, and they'll say, OK, um, now that I know that, let's go and start up the 3D printer. And this has not been yet invented, Professor Alex. I'm giving this to you for free. And so the university will help maybe work on this. And so what do you do with a 3D printer? In 10 minutes, you print off a bunch of vaccines tailored for you and your immune system and where you're going in the next six months. And you just have to do that every six months. I know it sounds terrible, but uh, mate, I have to clean the sheet. I have to change the sheets every six months whether they need it or not. And by the way, for those of you who are living in a share house and you don't have good access to a washing machine, here's something I discovered. You can vacuum the sheets and it keeps them cleaner for a lot longer. Don't tell your parents. Okay? And we reckon we'll get that in some time. That's where we're heading. Okay, so now let's bring on the lights and we're ready for the Q&A part of the show. And here's some stuff from Christmas Island. Okay, so bring up house lights. And if, if you have to go home for a meal or the babysitter or something, this is probably a good time. And now you're going to run the show. And if, yeah, Thank you. And there'll be people, if anybody in the audience, there's some very clever people here from uh, Newey, if you know the answer, how do we bring them out if somebody asks me a question and I'm not an expert in submolecular oh, biology? Um, well, there is a roving mic. We've got Chris, everybody up the back there that's waving his hand. So thank you, Dr. Carl. What we will do now, and thank you, Dr. Carl. Thank you. Yeah. And 
I feel, I feel compelled to let you know that my child is so smart that she already knew that she was smarter than me, even before you told her, Dr. Kelly. Ah, the, the, the thing is, we still know more than they do, but in a few years, they'll know as much as us, and they will provide us with a very good superannuation. Look after your mum. Look after okay? your mum. Right? Right. Okay, so for question time, and thank you for taking questions today, Dr. Carr, um, we can take questions from the room um, by waving at Chris over there for the microphone. And if you are at home, I think if you could move the slides a couple forward. I, I go forward now, do I? Yes. I oh, or do I have to go to a different. Or is it a different one, app? everybody? Uh, sorry, a different pr um, pr presentation, because yes. this is mine, which is different. Right. Just go forward? Just go forward. Go forward. There'll be a QR code um, that you'll be able to see at home, and also... No that's, no, that's the end of mine. We have to go to a different presentation to activate up, because we have two presentations on this laptop, and somebody... Will, uh, I'm not familiar with how well, to use... Well, let's take a question from the room, because I know at we least want to get questions a couple from of people there. down there. There's a wave. Here we go. So can somebody come down and, and do the techo stuff, which I can't do because it's a Windows machine, and therefore cursed? Okay, I didn't mean that. Okay, uh, the, is that Dylan? Chris? Chris. Chris, come on down. Chris, do your magic. Okay, yeah. to the audience first. Oh, and come to the microphone, young person. Got a oh, you've got a microphone. So who's going to fix the, the laptop and take it on to the next presentation? Alice, or the other will presentation? Come Alice you're going to fix it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alice. Okay, Dr. Carl, we've got Isaac, is it? Yeah. Hello, welcome. And your comment or question? Come on down. Why is Give the us a cat bone in the way white? Why is the cat bone in the way white from bobbing? Why is the bell curve? Okay, yep, yeah, yeah, come on. Why is the cat bone in the way white? Or parrot. Person with my masculine give yeah. So, why is the cat's bone in the way white? A bell curve when you increase the number of stories they fall from. Ah, the bell curve. Can can you repeat the question for us? Um, uh, person with face think, mask. I think he's referring to a video that was the height that a cat falls from and it causes there's a bell curve of the injury rate. Is that right? Ah. Okay, so firstly, um, there was a paper written called The Falling Cat Syndrome back in 1983 and it wasn't as though people in New York threw cats out of buildings but rather they jumped out by themselves and then brought them to the attention of the local hospital and they found that there was a weird set of curves where the injury rate increased with the height of the fall. Fall from one story, two stories, two stories, twice the height, more energy, more injuries, and then doubled again up to four stories. By the time you get to the fifth story, it began to tail off, and then it began to go down until finally, by the time you end up with cats falling from 32 stories, their injury and death rate was one-tenth of what it was when they fell from seven stories, and in fact, seven stories was the most dangerous height to fall from. And the reason was, was that the cat is just at that right, it's a bunch of things. Firstly, the cat is just at that size where it will reach a top speed of 100 kilometers an hour. An ant is very small, and you drop it, it'll maybe get to 10 kilometers an hour. A big dog, maybe 150 kilometers an hour, doesn't have the muscles or the strength or the bones to survive. A cat, lighter and fluffier, will reach 100 kilometers an hour and will just survive, providing it's had time to relax. So the injury rate went up until it reaches top speed of about 100 kilometers an hour. The top speed is governed by two things, the suck of gravity and the resistance of the wind. And it, that's called the terminal velocity, a rather chilling term. And it evens out at about, it kicks in about five stories, but the cat needs a little bit longer to realize that it's not going any faster. It lies back on its back, opens a mojito, puts a little drink with an umbrella in it, relaxes, lands, and then survives. 
So that, that, that's the uh, mathematics behind why it's safer for a cat to fall from 32 stories than from seven stories, but it still doesn't answer the big question, which was, did they jump or were they pushed? <laughs> Get oh, it? Pushed. I love it. Yeah. Well, I now have a, 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 a um, challenge for you from our Slido questions, Dr. Carr. Ah. So oh my gosh. when will humans... Oh, thank you, Alice. That was lovely. <laughs> it's all sorted. When will humans reach their maximum intelligence and what will it be from Levi? From Levi, when will humans reach their maximum intelligence and what will it be? Unfortunately, I read a lot of science fiction. <laughs> so sometimes my answers don't make a lot of sense, but here it comes. Um, I mentioned earlier about the chimpanzees. So we split off from the chimpanzees seven million years ago. Two million years ago, we had the mutation that we lost our body hair, so the protein went into our brain, so we started getting more intelligent, and we had a mutation to the hip so we could walk. That was under natural selection. Now we're in a situation with genetic engineering, and we're using genetic engineering tools. And the two big ones were, or the big one was invented by two female scientists in last year's Nobel Prize. They won it. It's called CRISPR. C-R-I-S-P-R. -R. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what it stands for. What matters is what it can do. When we understand CRISPR, we'll be able to have a large Rottweiler dog and then over a few months shrink it down to a Chihuahua. So we already see this happening in the Galapagos Islands where the marine iguanas shrink by 20% when times are bad. It's not that they lose a bit of weight, their bones shrink. The joints shrink. The whole th uh, creature shrinks. The brain gets smaller and then expands again. And when we discover the se secret of that, we can then start applying that knowledge to humans where we'll be able to modify ourselves. And going by science fiction, so I'm already into science fiction, and remember, it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future, that we'll, what we'll probably end up finding is that uh, we will end up with a mix of a human sort of meat, wet bag, meat bag thing like we got now with all its problems, plus a quantum computer embedded in the brain. But I'm kind of thinking that we have to get past the meat bag. Like, I love the hip joint. Hip joint is a good joint. It's a ball and socket joint inherently strong. Now, anybody watched football or tennis or netball and somebody does an ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, Mate, I love the hip joint, the knee joint sucks. Whoever invented that should be fired. It's like two soup bowls, a pair here and a pair here on, on each leg. So a pair there and a pair there on one, one leg. And then there are two bowls that are sliding over each other. And they're held in place by gaffer tape at the left and the right and the front and the back and even a stupid bit of gaffer tape that comes down through the middle from the top down to the bottom front called the anterior cruciate ligament. So. Talk about intelligence, read the book by Freeman Dyson, Disturb the Universe, and he reckons that the right shape for a human being is, I'm going way out on a limb here, a cloud of iron vapour. Oh. The diameter of a planet weighing 50 kilograms and being able to navigate through space and still talk to us. And if you can talk to me, it doesn't matter what your skin colour is or how many arms or legs you have or whether you're a cloud of iron vapour. If you and I can have a conversation, you're human, I'm human, we're both human. So um, I, I can see intelligence just going up and up and we'll probably uh, bypass the meat bag and planets and just become creatures of spirits and align all our kundalinis and chakras and sing kumbaya all the time or something <laughs> like that. I love it. Well, I'm not giving up my body bag because I would like coffee and chocolate after your <coughs> talk today. So I think we've got time maybe for one more from Slido, one more from the room. Um, so, Chris, you've got one from the room. Fantastic. Got another question here. Ah, wonderful. Thanks, Dr. Carl. Um, on Robin Williams' science program the other day, there was researchers in Australia talking about modifying wood. Modifying wood? Yes. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about that. They modified wood such that it was, the first part was it became transparent, so you could make timber windows. And the second one was that they lightened it, became much, much lighter, but much stronger. So we could use wood like we would use steel. 
I yes. wonder, could you talk to uh, technologies where we could use renewable resources in place of things like steel and concrete, which are quite wasteful? Well, uh, steel can get recycled, and we can make steel 100% without carbon, which I discuss in my book, uh, Dr. Carl's little book of climate change science, but wood. We have discovered how to make wood transparent and strong and stronger weight for weight than titanium and three times sharper than steel. We can make knives out of wood, you know, renewable as you said, and you look at wood and there's a lot of water in it. Forget the water, you're looking at a couple of proteins. One of them, oh sorry, uh, carbohydrates. One of them is cellulose. A ma a ma most common polymer uh, carbohydrate on the planet, cellulose. And it's really strong. There's a couple of other ones, hemicellulose and lignin, forget about them. How do you forget about them? So you get your wood and you put it in a very acid mix with sodium and it ends up destroying the lignin and the cellulose and then you're left purely lignin and the hemicellulose, you're left with the cellulose. Cellulose is really strong. You then compress it at a pressure of about a thousand atmospheres for 24 hours and then you um, heat it to 100 degrees C and suddenly you've got this stuff and there's pictures of this nail made out of wood and you can look at the video and you get this nail made out of wood and you just go bangity 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 and it just goes straight through wood and then you get the knife made out of wood and you can cut through a silk scarf uh, much easier than you can with the best knife yes you are right Yet another job for you, Professor Alex, to encourage more <laughs> growth. In, uh, yet another free project for your students. Talk to that man over there, he knows everything. Another qu how are we going? We time? could actually, I've been told we can take some more, but I do want to give one to Slido and then we'll take another one from the oh, room. Oh, Slido? Yeah, so they're not coming up for you, they're coming up for me, Dr. Oh, Martin. you've got the I'm magic the thing idea. there. Yeah. So now I have one uh, for, for, for somebody who would like to know why the same sky is blue in the day but dark at night. Okay, why is the sky blue? Um, and the way to think about it is a tennis ball. You got a tennis ball on a set of stairs, and just give it a little kick, and it goes across and down, across, down, across, down. And it keeps on going down, turning right angles all the time. So think of a wave of light coming from the sun, and after half, uh, eight and a half minutes, it leaves the surfaces of the sun, lands on us. Uh, well, it lands on the atmosphere, so we're going to pretend that the sun is over there, but this beam of light lands on a bit of sky over there. The sun's over there, and it lands over there, and for the first time, it interacts with something which turns out to be probably a molecule of nitrogen in the atmosphere. 80%, maybe carbon, maybe oxygen, 20%, but probably nitrogen. It gets absorbed and it gets re emitted. Okay, so it comes in a straight line from the sun over that bit of sky, hits a molecule of nitrogen, gets absorbed and gets re-emitted and two things happen. It gets re-emitted at right angles. Think about a little ball. It gets re-emitted at right angles and it's a little bit more blue. Why does it get re-emitted at right angles and a little bit more blue? I cannot explain to you in any uh, of the common languages on earth like Aranta or Spanish or Mandarin or English. The only language I can explain it to you is in the language called mathematics. It's called Rowley's Law of Scattering and you do the mathematics, simple thing, and you go, oh my god, each time it is absorbed and re-emitted it comes out at right angles and slightly blue. And it stutters its way from over there, to, 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 each time bending at right angles, each time getting more blue, until finally it lands on my retina. There are about four, five million cells called cones which respond to color. Some of them respond to red, forget them. Some of them respond to blue, forget them. Some of them, uh, to the, the blue ones are what we want, forget the green ones. And so suddenly I get the impression of blue by looking at that bit of the sky. Because the white light has turned blue by bouncing down to the ground. Now, here's an experiment you can do. 
Next time you go out on a sunny day, I think it's going to be sunny in March 22nd in 2022 or something like that. But we've got a sunny, cloudless day. Look at the sun. The sun's over there. And look around the sun. Don't burn your eyes out. And it's kind of a faded blue. And then chuck a Yui and look over there. And the sun is faded as well. And then go back again. And this time, civil 90 degrees. Wow, it's really blue over there. It's very blue over there. Faded over there, faded over there. Just go out and look and see if that's what you see and then try and answer why. And so why is the sky black at night? Well, the only reason that you can see the sky is because there was a molecule of oxygen or nitrogen that hit the atmosphere, sorry, that was hit by the sunlight and it gave off light that ended up in your eyeball. But at night, there's not enough light to excite them. There's a little bit of a very faint blue glow. So basically, there's no light hitting the atmosphere, hardly anything at all. And so you're just looking out into space. And there can be beams of light just going straight past you from the sun. But if they don't land on an atom, you've got nothing. They just, you can't see them. There's no way that they can let you know they've been there. But if you uh, do the experiment with a laser beam and blow cigarette smoke in its path, you can see the laser beam lit up. So that's why it's blue in the daytime but dark at night. Fantastic. And we've got something to do on the next sunny day as well then. So I think we've got Chris somewhere. Yes, yep. another question over here. Another question. Yep. Here we go. Hi, Dr. Carl. Big fan. Um, so when I got my first COVID vaccine, I got the Pfizer. Um, and I had a side effect called pericarditis on my heart. Um, I believe it's described as heart swelling. Um, and I figured, OK, that's fine. It's just me as a side effect. But a lot of, uh, not a lot, but two of my friends in the same age group received the same side effect. And I haven't heard of anyone of sort of older or uh, aged people uh, experiencing those side effects from the Pfizer vaccine. Is it just something that happens specifically to a sort of early 20 age group? Or is it just bad luck that me and my friends experience the same effect? And this side effect was related to the Pfizer vaccine? Yes. That's okay. Right. So it is well known that the Pfizer vaccine can really cause this complication with the heart. So the Latin word for heart is card. C-R-D, like car. And so peri means around, and itis means inflammation. So you can have pericarditis, so you've got the heart, bloop, 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 or once every second. And the coating, the, the membrane that's in can get inflamed, so that's pericarditis. Or you can get myocarditis. Myo is Latin for muscle. So the muscle can get inflamed. Firstly, your chances of getting it from the vaccine are one-sixth as common as happens from getting the actual disease, COVID-19. Uh, this is what we've discovered by giving hundreds of millions of doses and comparing it in people who are not. So you're safer off, even though you unfortunately um, got it, you're, you're safer off. Have you fully recovered from the pericarditis? Oh, hooray. I'm so happy. So, um, and you are dead right. It is the young males that get it, and not the... And then uh, if you go to the other gendery thing, they're less likely to get it, and if you go to older, they're less likely, likely to get it. It's just, we, we do not know why. We will know in a year or two, we, we, but we do know that it's definitely less frequent than actually getting the disease. I'm so glad that you came through it. In my case, um, I just got went for any vaccine I could get as soon as it was available because the side effects of the disease are much greater than the side effects of the vaccine. And the vaccine is not perfect in the same way that seatbelts are not perfect. So in the United Kingdom last year, out of all the people who died in road incidents, in the year 2020 in the United Kingdom, two thirds were wearing a seatbelt when they died. Does that mean that seatbelts don't work? No. 
So there's a very small number of people who don't wear seatbelts. They accounted for one third of the deaths. Everybody else wears seatbelts. If you drive into a brick wall at 200 kilometres an hour, you're not going to survive. So you, and finally to finish off, the protection varies in, from getting infected. Oh, so you, you either, you, you don't get infected or you get infected with mild symptoms. You get infected with um, severe symptoms. So you have to go to hospital or you have to go into intensive care or you die. So the vaccines provide you with about 60 to 80% chance of even getting infected. So the virus lands on you, you wipe it out, you never knew it happened. And then um, a small percentage of people will have symptoms and they go away. An even smaller percentage will go to hospital if they've been vaccinated, and an even smaller percentage will go into intensive care. So the protection against not being vaccinated is between 20 and 100, depending on which of those you're looking at. The vaccines are not perfect, but they're a heck of a lot better than not getting vaccinated. Thank you for that. That's a really important message. And I, I feel like we have to ask this question. Yes. Dr. Carl, would time travel ever be possible? Well, we were talking about the time warp, and the answer is yes and no. Oh, okay. it's, it's no in the sense that where are the time travellers from the future sitting right here in the audience <laughs> wearing their shiny aluminium suits with a lot of numbers and the horse race winners for next week? Where are you? Right? We've never seen any time travellers from the future with their fancy new technology. So the answer is no. But yes, there are two theoretical pathways by which we can do time travel. One of them comes from John Wheeler from the University of Texas at Austin. And what he suggested was that you get a neutron star. So look it up on Wikipedia. A neutron star, two to three times the mass of the sun, size of Newcastle, 20 kilometres across central Newcastle, and you reshape it into a cylinder, 20 kilometres long and one kilometre in diameter, and then you spin it a thousand times a second. And the outside is going at roughly half the speed of light. And then you put a spacecraft into a tight orbit around it, just above the surface. And it will then, according to the mathematics, get taken back in time to when that thing was first started spinning but it's only theoretical. Second theoretical one deals with wormholes. Okay, we do not know if wormholes exist. We are very confident that black holes exist, although there are a few mysteries. Firstly, black holes have no size. Just a show of hands, who knew that black holes have got no size? Yeah, so even though they have a mass of 10 times the mass of the sun, or 10 billion, their size is always the same, which is zero. The event horizon has a size. Secondly, in our galaxy, the Milky Way, there should be about a billion black holes from the evolution of stars that are heavy and go through their normal life cycle. We haven't got a billion. We've found three dozen. Where are the rest of them? We don't know. The nearest one's about 1,100 light years away. We are very confident that black holes exist. And Einstein and a few other people thought that maybe they're joined together by wormholes, but we have no proof. Let's pretend that they are. Let's pretend we're making a time machine. So there's a wormhole between you and me, and it has a property that if you put something in at this end, it comes out the other end instantly. No time delay. So we leave that end of the wormhole there. We get this end of the wormhole here. They're very stretchy. And we take it for a drive at high speed, at close to the speed of light, for one hour. And in that one hour, it might age you know, a thousandth of a second. And we bring it back. That end of the wormhole is one hour older. This is a thousandth of a second older. Go through that direction, you go into the future. Go through that direction, you go into the past. Does it work? Don't know. It was only a theoretical thing. So is time travel possible? Yes and no, depending. <laughs> OK, I think we can take one more, Chris, from the audience. There's a wave up there, frantic wave. <laughs> Why did my mum and dad get my, no, my, me, my brother, and my dad get static electricity when we touch our dishwasher, but my mum didn't. Does everybody in the house get Why the static electricity? Why did mum and dad get um, stunned by static electricity from the dishwasher, and somebody didn't? Or so, I got it. You did? My brother did. Your brother did, sorry. My dad did, but my mum didn't. Just mum didn't. Why didn't mum get 
static electric shock from the dishwasher. I, I'm trying to understand that one, I don't know. So, with my laptop here, when it's, we've got power going to it, and I run my fingers over the top of it, just gently, I can feel as though I'm pushing it over little tiny bumps. And the bumps seem to be moving, maybe. But when I pull the power cord out, I don't get that. I, why? I do not know. Um, now, you, static electricity is one thing, but you're saying static electricity from the dishwasher, and that kind of bothers me in that you might have to call in a sparky, <laughs> as we call it, to see if there's a problem with the earth, and it might be floating. So why one person picks it up or another, I don't know. And why some people get static electricity or not, I don't know that either. I used to foolishly think, and I was wrong, that you were more likely to have static electricity building up on your skin as a result of having a, what they call an oily skin, a darker, oilier skin, and that you are more likely to get it, less likely if you had an oily skin, and more likely to get it if you had a really so-called dry skin with freckles, red hair. And I've come across people from both of those, and some get it and some don't. I do not know why some people have it and some don't, but there is a cure, which is that you, uh, method number one, just wrap some wire around your tummy and hold on with sticky tape and then trail a ground antenna of raw <laughs> copper wire behind you wherever you go. Or you can go to the uh, electrical supply places uh, and buy little clip-ons that go onto your shoe. So these are sold for people who work in oil refineries and you clip them onto your, or, or people who work with electronic components that are very delicate. So it's a little thing that you clip on to the heel of your shoe over here, and then there's a little bit of wire that comes up and it wraps around with a little clip and a bit of elastic and sticks onto your skin. And that way the static electricity goes from your skin through the wire into the metal heel. The third way to avoid it is to buy the special shoes that oil refinery workers have. They're made of rubber, but they're just loaded with carbon. They're really conductive, but I haven't been able to find where to buy them because I haven't gone looking very hard. So I don't have the answer to your question. I've failed you. I give myself maybe one out of ten on that one. Sorry. <laughs> well, I think that's not a bad note to end on because we like open questions because that means we've got something else to learn. So I would love it if you would join me in giving another big round of applause for Dr. Carl. And also, of course, special thanks to Dr. Callan and her, and her special assistants today as well. <laughs> and of course, super thanks to all of you for coming and joining us online. Um, and I hope we will be able to invite you back to some more events next year from the University of Newcastle. And I wish you a fabulous festive season. Have some fun and we'll see you next year. And hopefully, maybe even Dr. Carl again. We'll, we'll do the time warp again. <laughs> time warp again.